Malcolm Renfrew Interdisciplinary Colloquium for Tuesday, October 6, 2020. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful autumn day here in Moscow, Idaho, and a special welcome uh, to our presenter uh, coming from Madison, Wisconsin, uh, as part of a team of scholars that are um, presenting today, and I'll introduce them in just a few minutes. The Renfrew Colloquium is now in its 20th year. Uh, I'm honored to co-coordinate this series with my colleague, Dan Buckvich, uh, who was part of the original team that put together the idea for this series of presentations by faculty, graduate students, postdocs, undergraduate students, and visiting scholars, all talking about their creative activity, their scholarship, their teaching, and their outreach activities. So before introducing our uh, team today, uh, let me just tell you a, a little bit about another program uh, that I think will be of interest to uh, those of you who are regular followers of uh, the Renfrew Colloquium. Uh, today at five o'clock Pacific time, uh, our colleague Allison Roy from the Department of History will be speaking about victory and triumph in ancient Rome. Uh, you may recall that she gave a presentation on this topic uh, last spring for the Renfrew Colloquium and delighted that she's going to have wider exposure today uh, through the network of the Idaho Humanities Council. Uh, so I hope uh, if you're interested in that topic, I have put the um, reservation information in the chat and you can just follow on that link to sign up and receive the login information. Uh, next week, uh, we have a cross-border collaboration uh, between Lisa Salisbury, director of the University of Idaho Women's Center, and Ken Fonts, a member of the History Department at Washington State University, who uh, is also a longtime um, faculty member in history and general education at the University of Idaho. And uh, they'll be talking about a global perspective on the construction of gender, and that's at 12.30. Uh, Tuesday, and we'll be using the same Zoom meeting next week. Uh, today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Nelson from the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures, Alessandro Martin from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, Olivia Weichel from the Center for Digital Initiatives and Learning at the UI Library, and Liam Marchant, an undergraduate student who is assisting with the digitization of this uh, project. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to learning both more uh, about a 17th century woman's correspondence, uh, but also uh, how it is being published uh, online. So uh, we'll have a little bit about uh, the content, uh, but also uh, the presenters will take us behind the scenes about uh, how uh, this process of creating a digital archive and making it available to the public takes place. And as always, we'll have questions from the audience if uh, uh, you would like to submit them in the chat as we go along and then our presenters will leave some time at the end to respond to your questions and uh, perhaps further elucidate some of the ideas they've presented today. So Sarah is going to start us off. So uh, welcome Professor Nelson. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and uh, give you a, a peek at my presentation. Uh, whoops, let's see here. Already doing it wrong. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, for, before I start, I just wanted to give a word of thanks to a number of bodies that have helped out with this project already supporting it. Um, I would, I'd like to thank, uh, of course, the University of Idaho Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning, um, where Olivia is a, a, a faculty member. They've been very helpful to me. Um, also, the University of Idaho Office of, of Research and Economic Development and the University of Idaho College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. They've all been very supportive of this project so far. So this project is just one little corner of a much vaster um, effort going on all over to uncover authentic women's voices from the past. Um, 
uh, let me just remind everybody of who has been working on it. Um, uh, I'm the head of the project and, and Alessandro Martina, a doctoral student in Italian from the University of Wisconsin, will be speaking after me about our work on the content of the letters. And then um, Olivia Weichel and Leah Marchant will, will talk about the website creation after that. Um, so this project of, of uncovering women's voices from the past, um, the, the woman I'm studying, Marie Mancini, and her, and her sister Hortense, Hortense Mancini, um, both uh, were people, were women who um, spoke out uh, strongly in sort of convention shattering ways um, at their time, but then we, we can see that uh, in both of their cases, their voices were quickly co-opted and uh, covered over by, by male writers. And so um, we can sort of trace a progression um, in the 1670s that, that shows this. The two of them became, Hortense and, Ma and Marie became uh, scandalous celebrities, especially starting in 1672 when the two of them ran away together from their husbands and, and began lives, itinerant lives sort of traveling across much of Western Europe. Um, unaccompanied and stirring up gossip and scandal as they went. So in 1675, uh, Hortense, who was uh, the Duchess Mazarin, um, he de declaredly was trying to rehabilitate her reputation, and but she took the sort of unheard of step of publishing her own life writing which is something that women of their status never did. Uh, she's in fact the first French woman ever to have published her own writing under her name and during her lifetime. Um, and her book, what, which got known as Mémoire de, it was, also, it, was often, it was often called Mémoire de M-L-D-D-M, de Madame la Duchesse de Mazarin, um, it was an instant success in 1675 when it was when it was published, and so um, for that reason, I'm sure in 1676, a very similar looking book came out under the same fictitious imprint imprint of um, Pierre Marteau in Cologne, uh, the same fictitious imprint that that um, had been on the cover of of Hortense's book. Um, this one purporting to tell the authentic life story of her sister Marie. Um, it was not at all authentic. And, the, and its publication so incensed Marie that she, she said she was obliged to uh, write and publish her real memoirs. And that she did in 1677 under, the, under the, the title that you see on the left, La Vérité dans son jour, ou les véritables mémoires de, Madame, de, de Marie Mancini connétable colonne. Uh, so the, the, tr the truth in its own light, or the authentic memoirs of Marie Mancini, a constable colonna. That was the, the title that her husband Lorenzo Onofrio Colonna had. Um, so she published, he, she published this text, which is very clearly written by her, as Alessandro and I can see the, the more and more we work on her, on her letters. Um, and yet, and, and uh, she, she also oversaw the translation of this, her text, which she wrote in French, into Spanish, since she was living in, in at, at the um, Spanish court in Madrid at that time. Um, and she said in letters to her husband that she was very pleased with the Spanish edition. And in fact, she sent it to him for him to read uh, before it was published. Um, but one year after her publication of La Vérité dans son jour, um, a, a male editor by the name of Sébastien Bremont, so in 1678, um, uh, apparently with neither the consent nor the knowledge of Marie, came out with his own version of her text. Sorry about that. Um, uh, his own version of her text, um, which he called Apologie, 
ou les véritables mémoires de Madame la Connétable de Colonna Marie Mancini, écrit par elle-même. So he says written by her, her herself, which she didn't bother to say because they were written by her. Um, he calls it an apology, um, uh, which, which already tells us that he, he sees her as needing a defense, whereas she sees herself as just um, needing to put out the truth. And what he did was entirely rewrite the text, flattening its style, conventionalizing its style, and erasing her very idiosyncratic voice. Um, and today, there are only about two or three extant copies of Marie's original edition in French, the La Vérité dans son jour. Um, presumably, this is because since 1678, when Sébastien Bremont rewrote her, her um, memoir, that is the version of it that's been constantly republished over, over 300 years um, as her authentic memoir, which it is not. So it wasn't until 1998 when the scholars um, Patricia Cholakian and Elizabeth Goldsmith uh, came out with a very careful edition of Marie's actual text. Um, it wasn't until then that um, that readers could again see exactly the, the, the actual text written by Marie Mancini. And so um, this, and that is the text, the, the um, Chalakian and Goldsmith uh, edition is what I used as the basis for my English translation of Marie's um, memoir, which I published in 2008. So, that was all part of a project of bringing her back to light. And now this project of publishing her unpublished letters is the next step in, in sort of making her voice um, audible to, to the contemporary audience. Um, so let me just, let me just to say two words about who they were. Um, Hortense and, and Marie Monsigny um, were, uh, were two of the num numerous nieces and nephews of Cardinal Jules Mazarin um, that he brought from their native Rome to be raised at the French court alongside King Louis XIV. And this is because Mazarin was, was the very powerful chief minister to Louis XIV, but who had been through the traumatic experience around 1650 of the Fronde, which was the rebellion by high French nobles against Mazarin, Mazarin's influence on France and the influence of Louis XIV's mother, um, Anne of Austria. And so he realized in the 1650s that he needed to consolidate his power. And he brought nieces and nephews from Rome to be married into the most powerful French families. Um, and so uh, Hortense, on, on the left in this portrait, and Marie um, on the right were uh, two of those nieces and nephews who were brought who were brought to the court. Um, Marie became famous as Louis the Fourteenth's first love before his marriage to the Spanish Infanta. But after he was married, um, Mazarin felt it necessary to get Marie away from the French court, and she eventually accepted a marriage with Lorenzo Onofrio Colonna. Um, sort of the most powerful noble in, in Rome, and she went back to Rome. And for a decade, the 1660s, um, Marie and Lorenzo were at the heart of cultural and artistic life in Rome. Um, but by the early 1670s, Marie expresses um, lack of confidence in her marriage. She, 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 um, it's reported that she uh, feared that, that Lorenzo was either going to be poisoning her or imprisoning her soon. And so she and Hortense um, uh, made a, a secret escape and uh, sailed from, from Italy to the south of France and began um, decades, the, the, the final decades of their lives were, were spent away from their husbands, never returning to their husbands. Um, and uh, so even though she refused to ever re return to Lorenzo, Marie um, kept on a very steady, um, regular and, and uh, detailed correspondence with her husband, Lorenzo, and she continued to play the, the role of the matriarch, matriarch of the family. Um, and it is those letters, along with um, 
um, other letters that she wrote to her eldest son and to other people that are held in, a, in, in an archive, the uh, a Colonna family archive in a Benedictine monastery in, in, um, in there's Louis the 14th and, and the husband of Marie. And they're, the Colonna family archive is in this monastery in Subiaco, Italy. Um, and the, it, it holds roughly 900 of her letters. Um, and for this project, we're beginning with 1672, the year that she ran away, um, and the letters that she wrote to her husband, and then also to a close female friend, uh, the Countess Hortensia Stella, who remained in Rome attached to the Colonna um, household. And uh, the, she wrote, Marie wrote in Italian to Lorenzo and in French to Hortensia. Um, and uh, so this, in this project, what we're doing is working chronologically from 1672 forward. And um, for each of the letters, uh, we have three documents that we're creating. A raw transcription um, that tries to give just a very precise description of, um, of uh, the content of, of each of the letters. An edited transcription, which turns it into correct and, and understandable, readable, uh, modern Italian or, or, or French, and then a translation with annotations, a translation into English with annotations. So I'm going to pass over to Alessandra Martina now, who can talk a little bit about our work on the letters. Thank and you. Stop sharing here. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thanks to Professor Nelson to the University of Idaho for allowing me to be part of this greatly meritorious project. My thanks go also to Olivia Liam, who contributed to the success of this endeavor. Uh, Mancini letters are an intense and fascinating reading. We've got all that we need in a good piece of literature. We have the thrill, the rising tensions between her and her husband. We have lies, a convoluted plot to keep us there. We have the seduction because our heroine is particularly charming although canny and astute. Her style is rhetorical. She's able to change subjects in order to divert the attention from hot topics. She's able to put, point out what her husband might find appealing in order to obtain what she wants. But she's fighting for a noble cause, freedom, the ability to decide for herself, for her own life. In her writing, she deploys intelligence and emotion. At times, she comes out strong and straightforward, not, not complicated and formal as in many letters of that time. Her style employs something close to a stream of consciousness, long lists of thoughts, sometimes unrefined, sometimes even contradictory. This was the first problem with our translation. We need to adapt her informal letters, in which any punctuation was absent, to a modern writing style. We had to make some changes such as commas, periods, semicolon, in order to give breadth to her paragraph. Another problem related to this was the order of closed phrases in the sentence. My, and Mary used to add important details related to one sentence after interposing many unrelated subordinates. She forces syntax to the extreme. Her fluid freestyle is borderline to the so-called and grammaticality. Finally, I want to point out her plurilingualism. Like a sponge, Mary absorbs words from any place she goes. For example, after setting in Spain, she starts to add in her writing some terms related to bureaucracy. They show her husband that she could take care of her family business and help her stabilize her situation there. It made him think that she was a good intermediary for the family. She was so aware of the power of language and communication that she asked her husband to use another secretary for writing his letter to the court. The one he had used an outdated, out of fashion Spanish that could not sound right to the snobby audience of the royal family. At the end of 1675, she used to insert whole paragraph in Spanish 
maybe to show her attachment to a country where she wanted to settle for good. This did not pose great translation problems. Some, difficulty, some difficulties arise when she used one or two function words in a sentence. Content words are easy to assimilate, mostly between two lexical close languages as Italian and Spanish. But with function words, we had to make some adjustments in order to allow the modern reader to understand her sentences without too much wondering and to enjoy the reading. Now I will share my screen and show some example of what I just said. I chose just a couple of letters. We have the first one, 11th of December, 1673. And we can see, we have two paragraphs here. And we can see that she almost never used any kind of punctuation. And so we have a long list of thoughts and action without any pause. In the second letter I chose, I'm trying to scroll down now, which seemed seems to be a little complicated. Here we go. Uh, we can see that uh, she started off in Italian and then when talk about bureaucracy and um, her commitment to the family business, she uh, quickly shift uh, to Spanish. Uh, the, first, the, first, the first paragraph in Italian and then some insertion of word here in the last line of the first paragraph. And then we start, uh, she starts uh, uh, writing only in Spanish. So that was my insight. And now I think it's Liam that will talk. Awesome, thank you, Alessandro. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming to this. It's great to see uh, some familiar faces on here. Uh, Carol, I hope everything is well. It's good to see you on this call. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen here and we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the CDIL as well as um, what digital humanities, uh, oh, host a spotlight. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our side of the project, turning um, these transcribed uh, letters into uh, XML files and um, but yeah let's get started. Uh, the Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning uh, is a collaboration between the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences um, and the University of Idaho Library. Its purpose is to advance digital, digital scholarship opportunities at the University of Idaho and also collaborate with different departments uh, around campus to make projects like these come to life essentially. Um, so one aspect of digital scholarship is to effectively digitize these source materials uh, into concise, descriptive, and archivable products that can be easily searched and researched for later use. And there's countless examples of this being used by other universities uh, across the country and the world. Um, the Walt Whitman Archive um, from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, uh, the Mark Twain Project uh, at the University of California at Berkeley, and the Petra Archive at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington are all great examples of these. And essentially they're taking large amounts of uh, source material that would usually take hours and hours of research to come across and putting it into one central location that's easily accessible. So because of this, um, because part of the mission of this is to make all of these lar large amounts of information uh, accessible, uh, it's also part of the project to make it in an easy to access um, format, such as a website, which Olivia is going to talk about here in a second once I'm wrapped up here. But to take the uh, information, and I have a flowchart here. So this is the flowchart um, of taking the original information and having Alessandro and uh, Sarah uh, transcribe it into a raw edited and translated version. We use XML which is uh, extensible markup language. And, uh, uh, and it's basically to make it preservable and usable for research, publication, um, 
the image of the text that we digitize must be transcribed into a computer readable text. And in most cases, the text must be encoded or marked up with tags that give meaning to its content and or structure. Um, so, for example, what I mean by marking up, uh, this is a, an excerpt from a W.B. Yeats poem. Um, right here we have uh, the text and inside of that we have the body and then we have um, lines that are demarcated by this. And each line of the poem is demarcated by this markup or tag that we put on each side and says that this is one line. And so actually, before I get to that, I want to talk about this. Um, so when we're marking up information, uh, it can get very convoluted very fast. And I have, a, for example, at the back of an Al Green album. And there's a lot of information that we can pull from this. Uh, we can pull who the personnel was on the album, where the personnel is listed on the right hand side, how it's indented on it, the logos, um, where they are, the song names, the publication information on it. There's a lot that we can encode when we transfer it into an XML document. And so when we, when we use XML, you can use, you can create your own tags or elements that define your own encoding for it. But to help us along the way, there's vocabularies that already exist and you can uh, identify that you're going to be using this vocabulary at the top of a XML document. And so some examples of this are the text encoding initiative, which is what the vocabulary that we used on this project. Um, but some other interesting examples are the music encoding initiative uh, and the comic book markup language, um, which is basically provide certain vocabularies um, to, to the document that we're using so that it's all standardized. The text encoding initiative is uh, almost universally standardized within this, within this kind of uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Olivia, but I'm. But um, I moving. Can't... Oh, yeah, you're right, Liam. And I, I can't, I couldn't hear you there for a second, but you sound. Oh, no. It's a... yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. Uh, so moving on to this project and how we went about encoding this information. So this is an archive card from the Kelowna archive that uh, Sarah was just talking about. And um, essentially, Sarah has transcribed all the information from this image to a shared Google document that we have. And then it's my job to take that uh, transcribed information and put it into an XML document here. And so we'll have uh, an element marking the text, an element marking the body, and then we'll have three um, div tags, which basically say this is either the raw this is the edited or this is the translated version. It'll include a file name. It'll include the letter number. It'll include the uh, image uh, facsimile that we use when we're creating the website. And it'll also include um, notes. Um, so sometimes on the document, Sarah will include notes uh, for uh, the reader's sake, or in this case, this is an archive note. And so we'll say, this is a note from Sarah. Those are her initials, the archive note. And then all of this information in here is copied directly from our Word document there. Moving on, we have uh, the letter body in XML, and this is the raw version. And when we're uh, encoding from the raw information, there's a lot more uh, text nuance than there will be in the edited or the translated version. And that's because uh, there's a lot more letters that are crossed out or sentences even, or you know, words that are crossed out. And we wanna mark that in the raw XML file to say this letter is crossed out. Or in this case right here, this is a double bracket signifying just a uh, clarifying note in the document that Marie first wrote IE and then wrote IL over it. Um, or in this case uh, with uh, Monsieur, uh, we use the highlighted render superscript to signify that that is a superscripted letter. Um, the edited letter um, gets a little bit more simple. Um, one thing to, uh, more simple in that we don't have to include as many crossed out letters or information such as that. Um, but oh, this is also a really good time to, to mention some of the things that we're going through and identifying um, 
for archivable purposes, as well as search searching functions for when people want to do research on this. We'll make sure that we include the date in an attribute or the key uh, or an attribute within our elements that we tag here. We'll also include um, the city in which or the location of where it's at. And all of this information just goes into our metadata that we collect from it. Um, another thing to note that we use hex codes similar to how HTML for special characters like accented O's or accented vowels or anything like that. The main difference when we get to the translation letter um, is that it will have uh, annotations with it uh, that help clarify certain things about the letter um, and contributes to the overall readability on the website. And so we'll put in these reference tags here, say annotate, as well as with a unique key for each annotation. And then the letter that, or I'm sorry, the number that the annotation corresponds to. So right here we have Spanish with a, uh, a footnote right there. And then we mark that in there as well. And then all of our footnote information goes in a separate spreadsheet that then gets uh, implemented into the website. Um, but that's all on my end. So I think we're gonna pass the mic on over to Olivia and she's gonna talk about the uh, web development side of this. All right, uh, thanks Liam. Um, oh, actually I want to share real quick in the chat. Um, the link to our demo website. So you can all check it out either while we're finishing up here or um, afterwards, but um, it's what I'll be describing from here on out. So uh, so this is a, what I'm showing on my screen now is an XML file that um, Liam had sort of broken down there for you and showed you in little bits. And I just want to point out before I start here that the work we did over the summer was in transforming these letters, um, starting with developing this XML template and developing a process um, for Liam to start getting into it and encoding these. Um, and because this is where the focus of the work has been for the last few months, I just want to note that this uh, demo site is very much still in development. But the foundation and the concepts and I think most importantly, the potential of what we can do with this material is starting to show clearly and what what is there now. Um, uh, and it also shows the hours of labor that go into these types of digital publishing projects when it comes to transforming uh, digital images into computer computer readable data. Um, this is a labor that I think too often is rendered invisible, but it really lays the groundwork for a variety of future research publication and uh, preservation opportunities. So uh, once we had this XML template set up and the workflow or process for encoding, I was able to write a script using a programming language uh, called Ruby to pull out all of the encoded text and insert it into an HTML file. So I'm going to jump over here. This is the HTML file that's the same letter as the XML that I just showed you over here. Um, so if you're not familiar with web development, HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And it uh, basically structures the layout of a web page. Um, so it was really important that we eventually get the text into this format, um, since having these letters online um, is, uh, was our original goal for the project. Um, and you might be wondering, why didn't we encode them in HTML to start with? Why do we go through this extra process? And that's just because this is a different type of encoding. Um, uh, it's one that doesn't so much as capture all the physical elements of an object as put it into a format for publication on the web. Um, so when we start with a detailed XML encoding, we can really capture all of those um, aspects of an object, be they um, related to the physical um, being of that object or the content that the object contains. And then um, we can transform that encoding to uh, any other format that we want to render on. So it looks pretty confusing on the back end here. I'm going to jump out to the actual website. Um, and so this is the exact same letter that I just showed you the code for. Um, and I can easily uh, now toggle between all the different versions that have been encoded. So starting with the raw, 
Um, we've captured all of Sarah's um, transcription notes, um, such as the things crossed out that Liam showed you, the superscript, um, the little notes of, of if we can't tell what, what it is. Um, and I can also pull up the image of the letter here and kind of dive into it and really explore uh, what um, Marie was writing and the, the, you know, the uh, original copy of, of what she was writing and compare it to this, um, this raw description, raw transcription, if I can't figure out exactly what she's saying. It's a lot of hard work to, to transcribe that handwriting. Um, when I jump over to the edited version here, I can see the modern French um, language uh, has been, um, you know, transformed into a more modern style of, of French, and so maybe a little bit easier to read if you're reading in that language. Um, and then lastly, if I jump over to the translation, uh, this is where all of those um, uh, parts of the letter that were tagged, um, such as people and places and annotations, really come to light. So I can see um, when I hover or click on these uh, annotation notes, um, Sarah's uh, little annotations pop up and I can, you know, read about who this person was and why Marie was mentioning him here and, and all that sort of thing. Um, if I want to uh, figure out who she's talking about, maybe I come across a name that I've never seen before and I wonder why she's mentioning this person, I can click on that person's name and that takes me over to a glossary page where um, it's not fully fleshed out yet, um, but it's kind of what we're working towards is to have all of these people defined um, so that people can, or our users can know who, who Marie is writing about and have that extra contextual information um, when, they're, when they're learning about her. Um, but I can also click on Nanette here and then it takes me out to a browse page where I can see all of the letters that Nanette is mentioned in. Um, and right now it's only two and that's because we only have six English translations um, so far and that's what uh, the people have been tagged in. But um, this is sure to grow as we continue our work here. Um, so I think you can see the beginnings of the various paths of exploration that are um, that are possible on this site um, and that the encoding is really driving. Uh, it's also letting us see patterns at a larger level that, that um, I think reading letter by letter wouldn't really let you get at. Um, so here, if I, from this browse page, if I click on English, um, here I can see the six letters that have the English translations, um, but I can also filter by um, other languages too. So French, I can see out of the letters that we've uh, transcribed so far, um, or tra uh, yeah, transcribed and translated, um, only 10 of them are written in French, um, but 96 of them are in Italian at this point. Uh, that's going to change as we get more letters up, um, but it's just one way to kind of see right now where, where is, um, what, what languages to use in the most out of this little selection. Um, I can also sort by date. So if I want to start reading these chronologically, um, this, it's easy to do so um, just by jumping in this way. Um, so some of our letters aren't finished, as I mentioned, not all of them have English translations yet. Uh, they're coming soon as we kind of work through this process, but all of them on the site right now do have raw um, transcriptions. Most of them have edited, but not all of them have edited yet. Um, so that's that's coming if you're watching the site for future development, just keep an eye on it and, and more will be added later on. Um, some other features that the site, uh, again, sort of lets you view those larger patterns um, are the timeline, which uh, allows you to see um, kind of chronologically and, and look at the little images of the letters too, which I think is kind of important um, across time uh, from 1672 to 1675 at this point. Um, if you hover over an image, you can see um, the date and uh, who was writing to who. You can also click on that image to really, you know, jump into it and and uh, and read about it. Uh, the map is very similar. Um, so here we're we're uh, looking at Marie during these four years um, spatially. Um, so we can see that a lot of her um, she she kind of had these pockets of of places where she was writing from. So in Belgium, if I click on this here, um, I can look and see what this item is, when it was written, who wrote it, to who, and where it's located, what, what language it's in. If I zoom back out here, um, I can see there's another little 
cluster in northern Italy um, and some letters in Spain as well. And if I do find a letter that I want to know more about um, the specifics rather than this sort of larger overview, um, I can again click into it um, and go and read it. Um, the last thing that I want to point out with the site is that um, these letters uh, were encoded following the TEI standard, as Liam said, um, and that's because this encoding language is common across all digital humanities, um, or most, a lot of digital humanities and communities um, and projects. And so this text will, uh, will lend itself easily um, within the sort of larger digital scholarship um, academic world to preservation and computational text analysis, um, as well as just other types of research in the future that maybe we can't imagine yet. Um, so to make that possible, this text has been um, made downloadable um, in, uh, it'll, it will be made downloadable in a couple different formats. Right now, um, you can simply download the XML um, and, uh, and, and use it for, for your research if you want to. Um, soon, there will also be an option to download just the plain text. So maybe that's um, a little bit more easier for um, running, you know, uh, putting it into Voyant tools or some, some other sorts of digital humanities tools that are out there to look at larger patterns across a body of text. Um, but, uh, but this is something that we, that we want to contribute back to the, the larger sort of digital humanities academic community by making this available. Um, especially since we put so much hard work into getting it into this format. Um, so there's quite a bit more potential that lies within this text. Um, and I think that the, the site has a lot of really exciting directions to go in with our visualizations and with looking at the patterns that we can see um, across, uh, across the letters. Um, and all this is made possible by this very large effort that we've been putting in most recently to getting all of the text encoded, getting it all organized um, right from the start so that we can have this sort of great foundation that we can build on in terms of our um, uh, research and exploration later on. Um, so to this end, we're going to continue encoding and continue developing the site. Uh, we're going to continue to tell Marie's story and make her, um, her voice accessible through the web. Uh, so lastly, on a larger level, I also want to point out that this is work that CDIL or the Center for Digital Inquiry and Learning really excels at. Um, but we're truly interdisciplinary and in that our projects bring people together um, with a wide variety of expertise to work on research and work on problem solving. And I'm glad that we could show you a glimpse of what this looks like today. Um, so that is all for me. Thank you for for um for listening and i'm going to throw it back to kenton because i think we have some time for questions here well great uh, thank you olivia and um, you'll see in the chat that she has put the uh, link to the letters of mancini website so if you'd like to uh, go there and explore yourself uh, i think it would be fun i was especially intrigued by the map that, that showed the the various locales around europe uh, uh, where uh, the Mancini sisters were. So uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, we already have a question from Leonard. Uh, and uh, he's asking, uh, in their letters and memoirs, are Marie and Hortense mostly in agreement? Um, do, do they recall events in the same way? Or do their recollections sometimes conflict? So um, Sarah or Alessandro, do you want to tackle that one? I probably can tackle that one since I've worked on both of them. Um, and before I answer Leonard's question, I just wanted to remember to um, also thank an undergraduate student, Wes Nagel, who is working right now with me on the French, uh, the French letters. He's doing an internship and I see he's in the audience today. Mm -hmm. And so as you see more French material being added to the website, it'll be thanks to Wes. Um, who's also a polyglot. So he's good for this, he's good for this, uh, this project because he also knows Italian and Spanish. So um, yeah, about uh, Marie and Hortense's um, uh, account, respective accounts of the events, I would say that, well, for one thing, um, as far as I know, we don't really, we don't have any letters up from Hortense. So 
um, I mean, at least I don't know of any, uh, any extant letters of Hortense, but we, they, we have both of their memoirs written at around the same time and talking about some things that they went through together. Um, and I wouldn't say that in any place do they conflict on their, um, on their accounts of things, but they do focus on very different things. They, the, two of them, the two of them talk about different things. Um, in in their shared time together, um, and you in, and you can understand why I think each of them is each of them is concentrating on the import of the various events for her own um, possibilities of establishing an independent life because they were together for a while but then they went their separate ways. Um, and had very different sort of circumstances that they were that they were dealing with. But I, I also just wanted to say you can really kind of see the difference between their personalities too. Um, for for one thing, uh, Marie talks constantly about her three sons, and in her letters, she's constantly pleading with their husband to let one or the other of the sons come and live with her. She's always um, asking about them, making comments about, about them. Um, whereas Hortense, and now again, I'm, it's apples and oranges because we don't have letters of Hortense's. But even in her memoir, Marie talks much more about the birth of each son. And whereas Hortense had three or four, she, she had three daughters and a son um, before she ran away from her husband and she mentions them not at all. The only, the only mention of even having children that she, that, that there is in her memoir is that she talks about having been forced to, to, to travel when she was pregnant. Um, and, and so that, I mean, that's an interesting thing in itself. But yeah, you can really, from the way they write, you can see um, different, different emphases and um, different personalities, but no conflict between their, their although they, they had a very conflictual relationship. And so they do um, both refer to moments where um, they were not getting along um, and sort of talk about it from, their, from each of their own standpoint. Um, yeah, but but as far as the truth of events, I have never seen any um, any uh, conflicting factual accounts of things. Um, um, intriguing question from Emma. That's something I've wondered. Did the Mancini's husbands ever try and take them back to Rome? <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> they did. They did. And uh, um, uh, so Marie's husband was in Rome, uh, but but. Um, Hortense's husband was in Paris. He was at the French court. Um, and if you noticed when I showed her her memoir, her, her title was the Duchess Mazarin. Um, and that is because she was chosen as Cardinal Mazarin's principal heiress. He had accumulated a vast fortune by the time he died in 1661. And so he, he managed to get those two um, Marie and Hortense both married off right before he died. Um, and he chose, uh, he, Hortense was his favorite. He chose her as his principal heiress and gave the majority of his vast fortune to her, but not to her. She, uh, she had no control of it. Who controlled it was the man that he, Cardinal Mazarin chose for her to marry. Um, and, th and for that, he, it was important to him that his name continue. And um, so he had to find a man who was of high, high enough nobility to you know, be worthy of them, uh, but not so high nobility that he would refuse to take on the Mazarin name and leave off whatever the family name was. So he found that person, but that person was very, um, uh, by all accounts, a very um, unbalanced and uh, and and um, uh, difficult man to live with, and so um, Hortense ran away from him in sixty in sixteen sixty eight, and went down, uh, went back and forth some, trying to get protection from Louis the Fourteenth to be able to live on her own. But so she constantly, until the end of her life, she was in litigation with. There were court court proceedings. Court, um, going between Hortense and her husband uh, for decades. 
And that was one of the reasons why she wrote and published her memoir was as um, bo to bolster her case in the law courts against him. Um, and uh, he he won, um, and and she was supposed to. And he won, and and she was ordered to come back to to um, uh, France to live with him from England, the English court where she ended her life, but. Um, her husband said that she had incurred debts um, in England. She, she would have to settle her debts before she could leave England. And her husband said that he, she had no right to incur debts um, under her own name. Mm. Only he could, only he could um, incur debts. And so he refused to pay them. And so she got to just keep living there until she died. And then after she died, he finally um, paid her debts so that he could have her body. And then he carried her body around France for a year from, from one to another of his, of his lands until he finally buried her. So, and then uh, Lorenzo constantly also tried to um, convince Marie to come back to Rome, um, uh, usually by sending emissaries um, uh, and, and by negotiating with the, with the, the, the kings and the dukes who, um, who were her protectors, but he also never managed to convince her to return to Rome. And he died in 1689. And um, after that, she she did travel back to Italy a few times to see her sons. But um, yeah, they both pursued getting their wives to come back until the ends of people's lives, but um, uh, neither woman ever returned to her husband. Sarah, uh, Evan is wondering, how did you s address a letter in the 1600s and how were they delivered? And this was certainly before Euro Post. Uh, yeah. So are they relying it, on couriers and em emissaries? Yes. Uh, Alessandro, I don't know if you want to take, take that um, question. I remember we talk and uh, have an exchange about uh, the time and the speed of this career, right? Careers. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting because they have some um, carriage, some uh, careers, and they uh, usually run uh, this carriage around, around the city in, um, uh, some the so-called postal, you know, um, postal place, uh, identified place where people go and check their mail. So there were some stations, I would call them, around the city, and uh, they will go check there if there were if there was any mail for them. And sometimes there were some extraordinary expedition. Uh, so. Um, some of these uh, mail carriers were asked to, to be more quick, quicker and to go straight to the, uh, from the sender to the recipient. So there were two ways and there were a third way even more quicker. Uh, well, no, even more quicker. My, um, I would say random, less, less uh, planned. They asked some merchant, they, they knew they was going to stop in Rome or stop in Florence, stop in Paris, and they asked them to uh, bring their letter. So there is a normal, a normal postal service, and there was uh, some extraordinary expedition uh, that was quicker and uh, instead of make different, uh, different stops, you just go straight. And there, there was this more, you know, random, casual, something like, I have a friend that's going there. I have, there's a friend of mine is a merchant. And, and that was very, 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 very common to ask uh, these people um, to take care of uh, not just letters, but goods. Like uh, when they had to send, um, I don't know, gifts, a bottle of wines and these kind of things, they asked merchants to, they, they, they knew they were going to stop the city to, to take that things uh, to their um, 
family and relatives. Yeah, there's a, and there's there's quite a bit of interesting scholarship that's been done about the development of postal routes and postal systems, both in France and in Italy. So yeah. So Sarah, all I was wondering, is your team collaborating with anyone in France or Italy on this project? Uh, not right now, um, although I do have a good friend who's a, who uh, has, is a scholar of the sort of English restoration. He's French, but he's an English professor at the Sorbonne. And I first met him because he contacted me about some questions he had about Hortense. And so I keep hoping that at some stage, um, it'll be possible for, for um, him to come in in some way on this, on this project too. Yeah, but for, for the moment, I don't, we don't have collaborator, collaborators mm -hmm. there. But. And could you, by way of follow-up, talk a little bit about uh, how this particular team uh, got put together, how uh, you connected with Alessandro and how you involved the CDIL in taking your raw materials and making them available digitally? Well, I just cannot thank everybody at the CDIL, Devin and Evan and, and Olivia and all of the various people that, that the, the um, workers who have helped with the project, mostly Liam now, but there were workers during the during the summer too, who started working on it. Um, the CDIL is just a great resource that has, that has been developed over the past several years at the University of Idaho. And um, they've been very uh, ingenious in the ways that they've used their limited resources to help um, faculty and students who develop projects. So there, there, there's quite a diverse set of projects that have been that helped along by the CDIL so far. And so I, the, I, I first of all, just, just started meeting them when, when um, there was a loose group of people um, uh, brought together by our former class dean, um, Andy Kirsten, um, and Devin Becker was, was sort of leading it up and we just started talking about what such a thing might might look like and then um, uh, Devin and others managed to actually get it going and then um, they have helped me in a couple of different ways. I was a I was part of a summer symposium a, a few years back where I tried to um, <laughs> start understanding how, how how digitization of manuscripts and how, how digital scholarship works. And um, uh, they still joke with me about how I, they made me cry the first day of that. <laughs> so that's why I'm glad for experts that actually know how to do this. Um, and then uh, last fall, fall 2019, um, the CDIL uh, uh, gave what I was, why I was a fall fellow through the CDIL, which um, provided me a one course reassignment to give me time to start putting this project together. And then I had a sabbatical last spring um, where I, I was able to keep, keep working with Olivia and then Liam after that. And I realized after a while that um, I thought I spoke Italian, <laughs> but I really don't speak Italian. And I realized as I was, you know, going, trying to go from raw to edited version uh, transcriptions of the letters that I really, I needed an expert. And so I reached out to, to my former professors at the Department of French and Italian in, um, in, in Madison at the University of Wisconsin, which is where I did my doctoral work. And they very kindly put, to, put me together with the ideal person, Alessandro, who's been just fabulous. We have time for perhaps one more question. If there's uh, someone else who hasn't uh, asked anything that would like to uh, join the conversation. And if not, uh, I've got a wrap up question and that is, uh, do you see a movie coming out of this uh, with, with the tale of the Mancini sisters and their uh, strange husbands and the intrigue of the courts? Uh, is that something that uh, maybe a, a masterpiece theater or something? I know. I think it would make a great movie. And also at different times, people just in at the U of I um, 
uh, have mentioned have mentioned the idea and i've never talked to anybody in in the theater department about this but i think it would be great to develop a play as a as a, a first step of translating it to performance uh, i bet rob casely would be interested mm -hmm. in talking to you about that maybe he's got a graduate student in playwriting who would uh, be mm -hmm. interested in in adapting uh, all of this raw wonderful yeah. Uh, rich material to uh, to the stage, right? And letters as the uh, you know as the material to start from um, seem like a promising way to work in the pandemic era theater because you know it could just be sort of a staged reading. Well, thank you to all four of our panelists today, and thanks for all the good questions out of the audience. Thank you for participating. Uh, next week, uh, we'll uh, continue with a, a non-COVID theme and with Ken Fonts and Lisa Salisbury uh, speaking about an international perspective on the development of gender perceptions. So hope you will join us for that. Uh, before we go, I'd like to invite uh, all of the audience to turn your cameras on uh, so that the presenters can see uh, the audience in all of your glory. Uh, and if you could uh, make a either a, a virtual round of applause <laughs> or uh, put your uh, hand up uh, through uh, the, the magic of Zoom. Uh, so uh, a terrific program. Uh, great to see uh, all of you with us today and uh, look forward to having you back uh, next week. So uh, enjoy the sunshine. Uh, have a great afternoon. Uh, be healthy. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.